Thank you.
Good morning, would you stand with us as we sing together? Sing, he's coming on the clouds. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. Every chain will break as broken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power, 
and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him our God is the Lamb the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb every knee will bow before him So open up the gates. So open up the gates. Make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the light. The Lion of Judah, he's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion. Sing, who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Stop the Lord. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin. Will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Okay, let's sing that chorus one last time, just our voices. Sing our God. Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before us. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion. Every knee will bow before Him. Would you stand and praise the Lord with me today from Isaiah, the 12th chapter. Join with me in proclaiming the word of the Lord. On that day you will say, I will praise you, Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have had compassion on me. Indeed, God is my salvation. I will trust him and not be afraid because Yahweh the Lord is my strength and my song. 
He has become my salvation. You will joyfully draw water from the springs of salvation. And on that day you will say, Give thanks to the Lord. Proclaim His name. Celebrate His deeds among the peoples. Declare that His name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for He has done glorious things. Let this be known throughout the earth. Cry out and sing, citizen of Zion, for the Holy One of Israel is among you in His greatness. Amen.
who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless thank you lord the god of ages sent down from glory to wear my sin and bear my the cross has spoken i am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever jesus christ my living Lord. hallelujah a hallelujah Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost his grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living Then came, then came the morning. That sealed the promise Your buried body Began to breathe Out of the silence The roaring lion Declared the grave Has no claim on me Then came the morning That sealed the promise your very body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me oh jesus yours is the His grip on me, you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Hallelujah! Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah! Death has lost its grip on me. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Well, welcome to the spring semester here at Gateway Seminary. Normally we get together in small groups and hold hands and all kinds of things, which we'll not do today, but I'm going to ask you still to pray, all right, and ask God to pour out his power on us for this semester and to give us the grace and the insight and the wisdom and the stamina we need to keep doing this work he's assigned us. And so I'd like to invite you to bow your heads now and spend a few moments praying for Gateway Seminary and for this semester and for the work we do. Pray out loud if you choose, pray silently if you choose. But let's call out to God for a few moments, and then I'll lead us to pray together.
Heavenly Father, we're standing here before you with our hearts bowed, confessing our need for you and acknowledging that despite our resources, our intelligence, our training, our demonstrated competence in so many ways, we simply cannot do the work you've assigned us apart from the power of your Holy Spirit working through us. So we humble ourselves just now and thank you for the opportunity of being Gateway Seminary, but then ask you in the name of Jesus, to empower us for this work you've assigned us. We confess our need for you, but at the same time announce our confidence in you, that you will work through us, in us, to accomplish what you want to do in your kingdom through our school this semester. I pray, Father, for our faculty, staff, students, family members and supporters who stand with us to make it all happen. Father, for every one of us, I pray that you would give us your sustaining grace and the stamina we need to keep doing this work that you've assigned. Father, I thank you for the years of faithfulness that you've demonstrated to our school. And because we look back over how many good ways you've blessed us, we look forward for the next few months with confidence, knowing that you're going to continue to work in us and through us. Now, Father, we ask you to empower these chapel services each week in a particular way. Lord, each week we come together around your word, singing and praying and hearing scripture read and trying to reorient our lives and our community to you. And I pray that this semester would be a particularly impactful one as we come together for worship and the word week by week. Thank you for hearing my prayer today. Now empower me as I preach, and use me today to accomplish your purpose in that regard. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's be seated, please. And as you're being seated, open your Bibles to the book of Zephaniah in the Old Testament, where as we begin our chapel series this spring on the Minor Prophets. Now you've been given a card on your seat, or if you're watching online, you can access that information through our website, which announces the chapel speakers for the spring. Most of them will be speaking from the minor prophets, although, although there are a couple of special chapels during the spring that will not feature this theme. But most of the weeks we'll be gathering, as we are today, to consider one of the minor prophets and the message God has for us from these somewhat, uh, and sometimes, obscure men from Scripture. Why have we chosen to focus our attention on the minor prophets this spring? Well, because the message of the minor prophets is needed right now in our world. Their message is simply this, rebellion and brokenness abounds. But repentance and restoration is always possible. Now, this morning, I hope to accomplish three things. First, I want to just briefly, in a presidential convocation kind of way, lay out some simple principles for, for preaching from the minor prophets. And then second, I want to preach for a few minutes from Zephaniah, hopefully modeling for you what I'm preaching. And then third, I want to introduce you to someone today whose life is an example of the message of the minor prophets. So first of all, some principles from preaching from the minor prophets. Number one, when you preach from this portion of the Bible, it's important to summarize the historical context, but don't bog down in too many details. Remember, the people who've come to hear you preach and teach have changed 75 dirty diapers in the last seven days, are fought to deliver product all over Los Angeles on these freeways, are grappled with COVID in a third grade classroom, and when they come to hear you preach on Sunday, they don't want a lecture about the Edomites, the Hittites, or the Assyrians. They want to know what the message of the minor prophets matters to them right now. 
So while historical context is important, don't bog down in too much detail. Number two, acknowledge the interpretive issues you find in your study of the minor prophets, but preach your straightforward conclusions. If you're a preacher or a teacher, listen, the people who come to hear you believe you have something to say. If not, they'd go somewhere else. So don't bog down in telling them about the three or four different ways to interpret every single word of the minor prophets. They want to know that you've made that kind of study, but they want you to declare your convictions and your conclusions to them when you teach and preach. Third, when you preach from the minor prophets, recognize that there are many linguistics and linguistic and stylistic forms in the prophets, and especially remember that these are poets and preachers. One commentator wrote it this way. He said, remember the creative use of literary features in the minor prophets, and I'm quoting, long, impressive first-person speeches of God marked by alliteration and paranomasia, chiasmus and hyperbole, literary allusions, anthropopoeia, metaphor and simile, lament, irony, marasmus, personification, synecdoche, and repetition. I had to look up at least three of those words because I had no idea what he was talking about. But this speaks to us that the minor prophets are poets and preachers. And when we read their language, we have to recognize that it's poetic. And if I can say it this way, it's preacher talk. It's still real, it's still valid, it's still true, but you have to understand the linguistic and stylistic forms. Number four, when you preach from the minor prophets, communicate major themes and focus on the big ideas the prophet was communicating. And I'll show you how to do that in just a moment. And then finally, when you preach from the minor prophets, make realistic connections to modern hearers. Be careful about applying the words of the prophets in literal detail to contemporary situations. For example, if the prophet said, the walls of the city have been broken down, don't you then say, and that's a symbol of the breaking down of the American legal system. I mean, seriously, highly doubtful that's what the prophet had in mind. Just be careful that you don't read more into the minor prophets than they meant when they said what they said. Does that make sense to you this morning? Well, I thought about taking these five points and giving you a 40-minute lecture on preaching from the minor prophets, and I thought how boring that would be, so I passed on that for my convocation presentation. But I lay out these five principles that I use when I teach my preaching class about preaching from the minor prophets to give you a context, a framework, uh, an understanding of how to take these sometimes rather obscure portions of Scripture and bring them to life in contemporary settings today. So keep these five principles in mind, and hopefully as our semester unfolds, our other chapel speakers will do the same. But now let's see if I can take you to the book of Zephaniah and model for you what I've just said this morning. The book of Zephaniah, of course, begins in chapter 1, verse 1, with these words. The word of the Lord came to Zephaniah, son of Cushai, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. Now, as you read this opening statement and compare these words to the other minor prophets, you learn that this is the only prophet who traces his lineage to the fourth generation, underscoring the importance of these early uh, of these descriptions. We know, for example, also that King Hezekiah reigned as king of Judah from 715 to 687 B.C., and that Josiah became king at eight years old. We find that in 2 Kings chapter 22. And most commentators believe that Zephaniah likely prophesied in the early years of Josiah's reign and may have contributed something to the reforms that were a part of that movement. We also learn from this introductory statement that 
Zephaniah was a prophet familiar with Jerusalem and familiar with the royal court. Now, why is that significant? Because oftentimes we think of these minor prophets as people from the country, rough, perhaps uncultured, coming from the outside to speak a word to the inside. That's not likely what happened here. Instead, Zephaniah was part of the royal court and understood what that lifestyle was was really like. That's the context in which we find Zephaniah coming with his message. And then, what was his message? I summarize it in these simple statements. Number one, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. He starts in chapter 1 by saying that judgment is coming against all living creatures. Notice chapter 1, verse 2. I will completely sweep away everything from the face of the earth. This is the Lord's declaration. I will sweep away people and animals. I will sweep away the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and the ruins along with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth. This is the Lord's declaration. Judgment is coming. And not only against all living beings, but against Judah more specifically. You see that in chapter 4, or excuse me, verse 4. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the residents of Jerusalem. And this judgment that's coming is characterized as being a great day of the Lord, beginning in verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near, near and rapidly approaching. Verse 15, that day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of destruction and desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and total darkness, a day of ram's horn and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the high towers. Judgment is coming. It's coming on every living creature. It's coming on Judah, and it's coming as the great day of the Lord. But then, Zephaniah is not finished. He says judgment is coming on the nations. And he lists several. He starts in chapter 2 at verse 5 that judgment is coming on the Philistines. He says, the word of the Lord is against you, Canaan, land of the Philistines. I will destroy you until there is no one left. He announces judgment on Moab and Amnon, still in chapter 2, dropping down to verse 8. He says, this is the declaration of the Lord of, the, of armies, the God of Israel. Moab will be like Sodom and the Ammonites like Gomorrah. And then he says, Cush will fall under judgment. Verse 12, you Cushites will also be slain by my sword. And then again, Assyria, dropping to verse 13. He will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria. So judgment is coming on all, human, on all living beings It's coming against Judah. It's coming as the great day of the Lord. It's coming on the nations, Philistia, Moab, Ammon, Cush, Syria, and and it's even coming to Jerusalem. Chapter 3, Jerusalem's sin is described in verses 1 through 4. Jerusalem's stubbornness in verses 5 through 7. But then in Zephaniah 3, 8, it says, For my decision is to gather the nations to assemble kingdoms in order to pour out my indignation on them. All my burning anger for the whole earth, all living beings, Judah, all these nations, and even Jerusalem, the whole earth will be consumed by the fire of my jealousy. Have you come to believe what I'm saying so far? That Zephaniah means it, that judgment is coming. And this judgment is coming on the wicked, the rebellious, and the evil, but it's also coming on God's people. The judgment is coming on God's people commonly, meaning in the context of living among the rebellious. It's coming on God's people collectively in the context of sin tolerated among believers, and it's coming on his people individually for their own personal choices. God's judgment falls on us commonly because we live in this world, collectively because we share in community and individually because we ourselves 
are even accountable. Judgment is coming. And because of that, Zephaniah says repentance is required. The second big idea of this prophet's message. He says in chapter 2, in verse 1, Gather yourselves together, gather together, undesirable nation, before the decree takes effect and the day passes like chaff, before the burning of the Lord's anger overtakes you, before the day of the Lord's anger overtakes you. He says, I'm appealing to you, repent now. And then seek the Lord in that repentance. Verse 3, seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth who carry out what he commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be concealed on the day of the Lord's anger. Zephaniah says, judgment is coming, but you can repent. You can repent. And he says, unbelievers, turn, from God, uh, turn to God. And turn away from your sin. And believers, turn back to God and turn away from your sin. But then, but then, but then Zephaniah announces restoration is possible. He says this starting in chapter 3, verse 9. He said, judgment is coming, but if you will repent... Restoration is possible, for I will then restore pure speech to the peoples, in verse 9, so that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him with a single purpose. I will restore you. And not only will I restore the peoples, but even more specifically, I will restore Jerusalem and Israel. I will restore my people. Drop down to verse 14. Sing for joy, daughter daughter Zion. Shout loudly, Israel. Be glad and celebrate with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has removed your punishment. He has turned back your enemy, the king of Israel. The Lord is among you. You need no longer fear harm. On that day, it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is among you, a warrior who saves you. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will be quiet in his love. He will delight in you with singing. I will gather those who have been driven from the, anointed, from the appointed festivals. They will be a tribute from you and a reproach on her. Yet, at, Yes, at that time, I will deal with all who oppress you. I will save the lame and gather the outcasts. I will make those who are disgraced throughout the earth receive praise and fame. At that time, I will bring you back. Yes, at that time, I will gather you. I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes. The Lord has spoken. Oh, this is such good news. Judgment is coming. And it's coming on all living beings. It's even coming on Judah and Jerusalem. It's coming on all the nations. It's coming. Repent. Oh, repent and be spared this judgment. And then when it happens, restoration is possible. I thought you'd be more excited about this. This is such good news. There is no doubt that sin is destructive. That evil is harmful. And that people in our world are broken because of all of this. But my friends, we have a message. And that message is repent. And when you repent, restoration is possible. Well, that's in the abstract. Now I'd like for you to see it very personally. I have a friend whose life demonstrated rebellion. He experienced God's judgment. He repented. And restoration has been possible. And I'd like for you to meet him this morning as I invite Kelvin Akins to join me on the platform. Would you welcome him?
Thanks for, thanks for being here today. All right. Go up. There we go. Thanks for being here today, Calvin. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to talk with you and have you tell your story. And thank you for that message. Okay. Well, let me ask you first, let me set it up this way. When you were a very young man, you were a very successful businessman. You started a business, you had a significant uh, success, a lot of people working for you, a lot of money flowing in. Is that correct? That's correct. Why don't you tell us about that early business success? When I was um, in my late teens and early 20s, I uh, was involved in drugs. Matter of fact, I actually manufactured PCP, and I had a whole team of people that worked along with me. I, um, drugs were being sold in New York, St. Louis, Seattle, various places, and as Dr. Orr say, I made a lot of money. So much money that I was bearing it under my mother's house because I didn't know what to do with it. You told me that you controlled a significant part of the region of California in terms of the drug, not only drug production, but drug distribution. It was quite, a, quite an organization you led and built as a young man. Well, in 1978, for those who remember, it was a newspaper called Herald Examiner, and they did an expose, a two-week expose on manufacturers of PCP, the, the major manufacturers in the United States. The second week, they talked about me and my comrades, so... I, I guess it was pretty widespread. Yeah. So you're running a major drug operation. You're manufacturing and distributing all over the country. You're making a lot of money, so much you had to bury it at your mother's house because you didn't know what to do with it. But then uh, judgment fell. Tell us about how that happened. Well, um, ultimately, you know, when you do things like that, it catches up with you. And I end up going to prison. Prior to going to prison, though, I must admit that I had caught probably 10 cases and had beat them all. Uh, spent a bunch of money on attorneys. and But I ended up catching a case in, in Kern County. And it wasn't quite as easy. I remember bailing out and going to my uh, attorney and let me know what happened, and he told me that, well, he couldn't fight that case. And I'm like, what you mean? He said, well, if I were to go to Kern County, they would run me up out of there, and they'll railroad you. So the best thing I can do is get you the best attorney there in Kern County, which he did, but I still went to prison. And during my time in prison, one of the things... Calvin, this is my next question. And how long were you sentenced when they sent you to prison for that? They sentenced me to five years. Okay, so go ahead and talk about that now. I uh, mean, go ahead with your story. Uh, which, fortunately for me at the time, that was the maximum sentence for what I was doing. But while I was in prison, my one of the things that I, I realized is that I was taking unnecessary penitentiary chances. I was trying to make money and didn't need it because I don't even know what to do with the money I got. So every time I'm going out there making more money, it was just unnecessary penitentiary chance. And I decided that, I come to realize, I should say, that money was a tool. And when I get out, I wasn't going to stack money anymore. I was, I was going to get it when I need it, but use it as a tool. And I got out of prison. With that in mind, my, my, my wife had got her real estate license right before I went to prison. 
And when I got out, the plan was to, that she get a broker's license and I get a contractor's license. And we bought property, renovate it, resell it, and, and, and do that. And when I got out, that was the plan. And she got her broker's license and I got my, uh, I was working on getting my contractor's license. I was in school. And, but I was still doing what I was doing, but not in the same manner, because prior to me going to prison the first time, I would probably manufacture PCP every other week, and it was like 15 to 30 gallons. But when, when I got out, it was only when I needed it. It might have been five gallons. But I ended up going back to prison, make a long story short. And uh, when I was arrested, it was me and my brother. We had went to Seattle, and we were on our way back with five gallons of PCP because I had one person was going to pay for it. And uh, my brother was speeding. He was driving, and highway patrol pulled us over, and they found the drugs, and we ended up going to jail. And there, sitting in the cell, I was trying to figure out where I went wrong because I was doing everything according to plan. I had planned on my wife getting hers and me getting, and we had property in escrow that we were about to renovate. Everything was going according to plan. And I'm like, what happened? Why am I here? And my brother, unbeknownst to me, he had been to prison before as well, uh, and he, end up getting off the bunk and getting on the floor and he started praying and he was crying. Now, this particular day happened to be his wife's birthday and it also happened to be the day that uh, his class reunion was and they were planning on going to his class reunion we got back that after that evening. We got rested that morning so all, everything hit him, and what I didn't know is that he had accepted Christ when he was in prison before, but he had got out, and my older brother and myself were still doing what we were doing, so he ended up backsliding, and now he's, he, he, he's torn up, and when he got on the floor and started crying and went to praying, initially it scared me. I was, what's going on with him? Uh, so I looked, but then I, when I realized that he, he was just going through his thing, uh, I went back to trying to figure out where I went wrong. And I'm hearing him in the, in the side of, and, and the more and more I hear him and the more and more I think, I come to realize where I went wrong is I was trying to do wrong right. And there's no right way to do wrong. wrong. And before I knew it, I was on the floor next to him giving my life to Christ. That was May 31st, 1986. All right, so rebellion and repentance, all right? So you came out of that experience, and I want you to tell uh, how you, the first part of your story of how you came out of that and... Uh, started a new life and a new career, and then I'm going to pick up and talk. I'll, I'll interrupt you at some point, and then I want to talk about how you've ended up, okay? So talk about how you got started in a new life and a new, a new direction after you repented. Well, let me begin by saying, since you asked me the other time, they, they gave me eight years this time. Yeah. Uh, but that was such a wonderful experience. Me and my brother, we, we would study eight to 10 hours a day. And I remember telling people in prison that I was happier than I'd ever been in my life. And I had a joy above joy. I had a peace above peace. I knew that God was, whenever God opened the door to let me out, and I wasn't in a hurry, but whenever he did, I, I knew that he was going to bless me. I had no doubt. And... I was released in August of 1990, and I, I planned on going back into what I was going to do, you know, construction and 
but I called a buddy of mine and went to work with him. I worked for three days, and the fourth day I rolled out of bed. I had scoliosis, and I couldn't do that type of work at all. And it, it broke me. It was like I didn't know what to do because I'd never worked before. I'd never looked for a job. I, I, I had knowledge to create a resume, but I didn't have nothing to put on it. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I didn't know what to do. I remember one day my wife came home from work, and she looked at me, and I'm sitting there, and she said, you know, you're going to have to do something. And I felt this small, I, I because did, I didn't know what to do, but uh, she talked with a, a member of the church who was a director there at King Drew Hospital at the time, and she took a chance and got me a job for King Drew as a contract worker, but an intermediate clerk. So you got a job as an intermediate clerk working as a contract worker at a hospital. And that was the first, I'll say, real job you'd maybe ever had after five years in prison and mo about eight years in prison and all of this getting you to that. All right, keep telling your story. And while I worked there, I, I, I act, they actually promoted me to senior clerk, still contract worker, but... I continued to take the test, uh, various civil service tests, and I would pass them and get high scores, and I'd go for interviews, but no one would hire me because of my background. But finally, I, I, I got interviewed for enemy clerk at the Auditor Controller, LA County Auditor Controller's office. And I remember going to the interview and there was a white woman and a Hispanic woman that interviewed me. The Hispanic woman was the supervisor of the white woman, but the white woman was the supervisor of the unit that needed me to go into. Uh, and the white woman didn't want to hire me because her husband was a parole officer, so her, her view was sort of skewed. But the Hispanic woman did, and she hired me. And probably about two weeks later, when she received a bunch of flack for hiring me, but two weeks later, I remember parking my car, and she parked her car at the same time. We walked over to the job together, and she was very talkative. You know, she was just rattling off. And in the midst of it, she said, uh, you're a Christian, aren't you? I said, yes. She said, in the interview, you made a statement. It was something very insignificant, like that's a blessing. But she told me, well, I don't remember what it was. And she said, when you made that statement, I knew you are a Christian. That's why I hired you. And so I, I ended up getting that job. And in the first 12 years, I received nine promotions. God really blessed me. All right. Let me summarize, then I'm going to skip ahead, okay, for sake of time. So you started out as a young man with a lot of promise, but you tried to do wrong right. And you ran this business, and it got you a lot of money and a lot of notoriety. You wound up in prison, got out, got in trouble again, back to prison, five years, eight years. Repentance, and now restoration is taking place. One thing I didn't say in the message is, I would like to make more clear now is, you know, forgiveness is, a, is something that happens in the moment, but restoration can take a long time. And that's what happened with you is you got into this job by slowly getting opportunity, and this woman hired you. Over the next 12 years, you said you were promoted nine times, all right? But I want you to fast forward now to the end of that career before we talk about the one you're in now, but let's talk about the end of that career. Uh, you worked there for about 30 years, right, for, the, for Los Angeles County. All right? And I want you to tell everyone what you wound up doing and the job you retired from and the scope of responsibility you had, the people you supervised, and the amount of money you controlled at the end. Well, the last probably 12 years I worked for the Auditor Controller, I managed the apportionment section of the property tax division. And the apportionment section is the one that actually calculates 
the property taxes for all the property, 2.3 million properties in LA County. Uh, they ca calculate the tax bills as well as once the money is received, because they calculate the tax bills forwarded to the Treasury Tax Collector, they, they, they bill it and collect it, but then it comes back and we're responsible for apportioning that money throughout the various taxing entities within, within LA County. And so we were responsible for roughly about 18 to 20 billion dollars a year. And I was the one who signed off moving this money every year to the various places. Now the, the ironic point is that all my staff were accountants. I had 22 staff that were accountants. My undergraduate degree was not in accounting. As a matter of fact, I did get my undergraduate after I got out of prison. But my undergraduate degree was in finance. I really didn't have no reason. No, I should have been in the position that I was in, but only God. He opened the door. And I, I never forget, and I believe I shared this with Dr. Orr, the first time I got in that position, the staff bought me a reconciliation. It's about this thick and a bunch of papers with a bunch of numbers. And all I could do was pray. I didn't know what I was looking at, you know, but uh, God blessed me. Yeah. So you worked for 30 years, basically, at the county. You wound up being responsible for 18 to $20 billion in tax revenue annually being received and distributed from 2.3 million property owners in L.A. County. You supervised 22 accountants and all the support staff that was required to make that happen. And that was at that moment, sort of the ultimate restoration for you, but not quite. Because during all that time, you were also growing in your faith, growing in your commitment, and growing in your leadership capacity as well in your church. And so today, you're an elder at Mount Zion Church, but you're also my pastor. Uh, you are the pastor of the South Campus of Mount Zion Church, and an on-again, off-again student here at Gateway Seminary, I might add. Uh, your senior pastor, Dr. Brian Kennedy, is here as well this morning. You work on his team. How did you go into pastoral ministry when you retired from the county, and how did that? How did God even restore you to that level of leadership and responsibility? Well, as I was working there at the Art of the Controller, I had a good position, but God had blessed me to get a master's in theology. And then he allowed me to come to Gateway where I got a doctorate in ministry. But I worked for the county. And when I received my doctorate in ministry, it was like, I can't continue doing this. I can't, con I, I, I have to step out on faith. My managers really just knew I wasn't going to retire <laughs> because of the money that I would make because if I'd have worked another three years, I could have got 75 to 80 percent of my salary. But when I retired, I received roughly about 49 percent of my salary. But I, I had to step out on faith and trust God. So I retired, and I talked with my pastor at the time, Brian Kennedy, and and I say, well, well, you know, I'm coming, because he had already always told me once I re decide to retire, I can come on board. So I told him, I'm coming on board, so what do you have for me to do? He said, well, we're about to plan a church. We want you to be the pastor of the new church. And the ironic thing is I had been putting in for churches for probably six or seven years there in L.A. County, and I kept Every time it was me and some other person that be the final candidates or me or two other people, but I would never be the one chosen. And that was that aha moment. Oh, all this time, this is what God wanted me here in, in Ontario. Good word. Zephaniah is not an old dead prophet in an insignificant book. He said... Sin leads to judgment, but repentance can lead to restoration. And this is the 
kind of person he was talking to. A uh, fellow who ran a drug industry, uh, went to prison twice, but came out of that in repentance, asking God to make something different out of his life. And I think he did, giving him an incredible career in public service, and now a graduate of our school and a career in ministry leadership as well. So I'm thankful to God, I really am, that sin does lead to judgment, because that motivates us to repentance, and repentance gets us to restoration. So Kelvin, thank you for telling us your story this morning. Thank God for you, and thank God for your ministry and the life that you've lived and the example of restoration that you are. Could you congratulate him and thank him for being here today? Thank you for having me. As we conclude chapel today, let me uh, remind you that we'll also be having a number of special events associated with chapel this semester. Uh, there are leadership luncheons, including the one next week, which focuses on pastoral ministry, talking to a church planting pastor who founded a church and has led it for many years. He'll be talking with all of us about what that process is like. And then other leadership luncheons later in the semester as well. And then special events that spill out of chapel, like the missions conference and faculty dialogues and other events. So pay close attention to the website. Lots of things going on here at Gateway as we are able to reassemble with each other in these formats are making it possible for us to resume these activities this semester. Uh, let's stand together and pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you so much that repentance leads to restoration. And thank you that this is not some abstract principle, but it's real in the lives of people all around us. And so motivate us as preachers and teachers to go into a world, yes, with a serious message that sin is destructive and that judgment is coming, but also motivate us to preach that repentance is possible and restoration is always available when you work in our lives in this way. And we thank you for it today in Jesus' name. Amen.